I've known a lot of those athletes where, you know, the Dominic Cruises, Ronda Rousey's, these types, they're not giving an inch. If they're, if they're losing in the rule set that, that you said, that I said as a coach, they'll flip the game board over and change the rules and do something that's illegal because they want to win. I had a really hard time with grappling with mentally and, you know, I fell into depression and I really had no desire to, to do anything in life for a while there other than just feel sorry for myself. Connor's great, obviously, but I do think he brings this level of delusion to the game a little bit where sometimes it's like, like he has proven to everyone that he is amazing, obviously. But, you know, we all saw what happened with Khabib. We all, I mean, he did do pretty well, though. It's just, it's been a while. For whatever reason, you know, judo um, within this jujitsu space doesn't get the credit it deserves. I feel like the foundations which jujitsu was built on is all because of judo, but that history has been lost. And I think there's things of like that coming back into like the historical viewpoint because people have brought that in and say, yeah, it's all judo. You know, it's just been rebranded. Welcome back to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Please like the video and subscribe to our channel. Today's guest is a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Judo black belt. He's a Division I All-American wrestler. He is the former Judo coach for the US uh, Olympic team and Ronda Rousey, J. Flo, Justin Flores. Justin, we did it. Welcome to the Everyday Perspective podcast. How are you? I'm well. How are you guys? Yeah, we're good, man. Yeah, thanks for joining us. It's uh, taken a few attempts, but we got there in the end. So uh, it's awesome to, to meet you finally and, and be having a conversation. Yeah, thank you, Paul and Danny, for having me on. I'm uh, humbled and honored. And, you know, I'm looking forward to having a good conversation about a myriad of, con of conversational topics. Yeah, perfect. Um, so we did a bit of an introduction a second ago for our for our audience. But of course, you, you've, you've got quite a few credentials, mate. So uh, Judo and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Black Belt, Team USA Olympic Coach for Judo. Um, Division One All American wrestler, I think formerly head coach um, or head judo coach for Ronda Rousey as well, um, and currently still work with a number of sort of high level professional mixed martial artists. So that's that's quite a, a, a I guess a, a suite of martial arts and an experience you've got there. But where did it all start for you, mate? Where did your martial arts journey start? So um, judo, but. I think where my athletic endeavors started, which I used to be not so proud of, and nowadays I kind of, you know, I look back at it and I, I give a lot of credence to it, was um, my elementary schools, for some weird reason, had a jump roping team. So, uh, <laughs> like, so we were called, oh, there goes my call flower here. Um, <laughs> we were called the San Diego Sand Skippers, which... Um, we would travel around and do demonstrations at Disneyland, SeaWorld, different schools. And then we'd have competitions in California and outside of California where we would, you know, do compulsory dem like jump roping. Like how many jumps can you do in a minute? How many double unders can you do in a minute? Um, double Dutch, uh, like creative freestyle and all these different categories. So from age five to nine that was kind of my journey and then uh, i started in judo when i was eight and a half yeah so so skipping yeah quite an unusual start then but i guess from a footwork perspective i feel that would be quite quite transferable was that the case yeah definitely that's a cardio uh footwork just coordination agility those kind of things that are really important in judo and then those transferable skills really did relate well with wrestling um, and wrestling, I mean, folk style wrestling, American style wrestling. I didn't really get the opportunity to wrestle freestyle or Greco just based on the seasons that I was, I was training really hard in judo as my primary focus. So, um, I really wish I did delve deeper into freestyle wrestling just because I think I could have had a lot of success there when I saw a lot of my teammates having a lot of success that I did well against or wrestlers that I would compete against that were were winning on the freestyle side so i feel like i kind of missed my calling a little bit there but you know my core base of who i am and what i learned my foundational and cultural 
and ideological perspectives were based upon is like the judo culture. You know, it's Japanese. Um, it's, it shows a lot of compassion for your partner and, and respect and mutual respect and well being. So it's not just a brutal sport, which, um, you know, a lot of these skills transfer into MMA really well, which is pretty brutal. Mm. Yeah, I think it is quite a difference. I, I've got a four-year-old and I've just started him in judo. Um, and it was because of the, I guess, the tradition, the, the discipline and the culture opposed to starting him in jiu-jitsu or, or MMA. It's probably something that will get him into a little bit later, but I definitely see a, a difference. Yes. Um, we, we did have uh, a, a, an American chap on who... Um, He's got a few national titles in, in wrestling, Brandon Reed, if you, if you know the name. Oh, yeah. He's just uh -huh. started competing in jiu-jitsu a fair bit. And he, he talked about folk style wrestling a bit. And he said primarily in the US, that's what you guys do. Yeah. Um, so was, was it that, that that was just the main thing that was available for you from a wrestling perspective? Is that why you ended up doing that as well? Yeah. So um, I didn't really start wrestling seriously until I was in high school. So I was about mm -hmm. 14. Um, but okay. I'd done judo for five or six years up to that point. And my brother, who's two years older than me, was wrestling on the wrestling team and he had a, a lot of success with very little coaching just based on like the high school we lived next to didn't really have great coaches. And then when I uh, enrolled in high school, I started wrestling. Um, so I'd seen him wrestle for two years and kind of learned through osmosis and, and learned from his mistakes and learned what worked for him and adapted and improvised and was able to kind of carve out a, a good first season of wrestling with you know, not much experience. I had a thousand matches or so in judo up to that point. So I had a lot of mat sense and knowing how to win and, and where to be. But the technical aspect of it, I didn't really learn how to defend the leg shots yet. So people would be shooting in singles, doubles, low singles, high crotches, fireman's carries, which those existed in judo in my era, but not to the degree where that was the base core of how that sport fundamentally ran. So I had to learn how to sprawl and defend leg attacks, which took, you know, time. So I, I would have all these high scoring matches because I'd throw people to their back and get five points. And then they would take me down four or five times and it would tie it up and I'd throw them to their back again. And be like 15 to 18 would be the final score where it's kind of a slop fest. If we look at it from now, like good wrestling, but I learned a lot from that first season and I didn't have the, the most success. And then my coaches, the new coaches that were hired for my high school wrestling team were, were really good. Uh, so I had a good core group of wrestlers that, that understood wrestling as teammates and then new coaches who came along and really changed my perspective on the sport. And from then on, I really didn't lose much at all ever again in high school, at least. So I won maybe 115 or 120 matches where I didn't really take a loss. So I learned <laughs> how to adapt my judo and infuse it at the right time rather than forcing it. Cause it's really hard to force judo when someone's back backing up in a low stance, as you see in no key jujitsu, it's where MMA, where if someone just doesn't want to engage. They don't have to, they could shoot under you or, or kind of wrist tie or hand fight and do these different things that don't bode well for a, just a pure judoka. So I, I definitely became more of a hybrid athlete where where both sports were were my focus and then um just to keep going on a rant here about my you know evolution as a grappler um i kept going with the wrestling over judo moving into college because my brother was the number one u.s athlete at uh, 145 pounds wow, and i was okay. the number two athlete at 132 <laughs> pounds for the olympic ladder and i was only 16 or 17 at the time so yeah. I, I kind of chose wrestling just based on I couldn't make 132 pounds healthily when I was 17. And I accepted a scholarship to the University of Nebraska, which was a top three university for wrestling up there with Iowa and Oklahoma State and Penn State. So I, I kind of my heart was with judo mm -hmm. and I was still train judo, but I was embarking on a new journey where, where wrestling was the primary focus. So I was a little bit in culture shock moving from San Diego beach surfer town to Lincoln, Nebraska, which is the middle of the country. <laughs> you know. And, you know, there's no mountains. Uh, my whole north, south, east and west compass was just like completely altered. I didn't have any bearings. So I kind of had to start over from scratch as far as, you know, who I was and 
what kind of drove me because, you know, usually I, I had these two sports to bounce and feed off of each other as well as my family. And in this case, you know, I left everything I knew and went 2000 miles away to, to start over. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's a different world, isn't it? Yeah. And what was the, what was the age difference between you and your brother? A year and a half. So he grew up. Yeah, okay. And I was always be nipping at his heels in different, you know, sectors of our lives, whether it was, you know, drawing or, jump roping or running or anything I was always nipping at his heels trying to to one up him and every time I would kind of catch up with him he would quit that whatever it was <laughs> move on to something new and then I would I would follow follow him around you know like a shadow and yeah, I think well, in the long run, it really helped develop who I am today you know I owe a lot to my brother he's the best technician I've ever known or, or will know and his stats were, were really good as far as his wins and losses in both judo and wrestling. But uh, as far as like technically speaking, he was far superior to me. He, he, the way he could analyze things and break things down and understand movement without having to really train it, where I had to, I had to work really hard. Mm -hmm. He could see something and implement it into his game immediately, just basically out of pictures out of a book or a, a, a old VHS tape of the Olympics from the 80s which my father made us watch religiously growing up. So those were our Bibles growing up, the, the 84 <laughs> and 88 Olympics for judo. Yeah, amazing. So are you from a grappling family then? Did your, your parents wrestle or do judo as well? So my dad is a, more of a traditional martial artist, but he's a black belt in judo as well. And um, he was Ronda Rousey's mom's teammate at Tenry Judo Dojo in Los Angeles and coached her. Okay, yeah, yeah. And so there's the connection. My dad's actually Ronda's godfather. So growing oh, wow. up, okay. he would come and live with us for months on end, sleep on our couch and train with me and my brother. And, um, but yeah, he, he's a black belt in, I think, seven different disciplines of martial arts, mostly <laughs> Japanese based ones where it's like, you know, Kendo, Iaido, two different forms of Karate, Japanese Jiu Jitsu, Judo. Um, so he, he had a plethora of knowledge and he was, you know, he worked closely with Gene LaBelle, who was his sensei in judo. Um, so he was in a lot of roles in movies growing. When I was even young, I would see him as like getting thrown over the bar in a movie, <laughs> like a quick take. And then he would get little checks in the mail for $3 as, a, you know, just a residual. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I had a, I had a, a good core base of, of martial arts in my family that kind of led me to the life i'm in today yeah brilliant wow and is your brother still involved in grappling today or is he uh yeah, is he gone to something else now that you can do? yeah so he has his own judo dojo in san diego san diego judo dojo is the name um it's in poway he uh they just opened that him and his uh wife leilani akiyama who was on the national or girlfriend they've been together for 10 years uh they've been together for 10 years or so but um so yeah, they started their own dojo and she was on the national team for, for Team USA for five world teams. And I actually coached her in her last two world championships. So um, yeah, I, I, they have a, a really good dojo that starts with kids classes and, and adult classes and trying to hybridize, you know, all the, the jujitsu in the area to kind of, you know, not change the meta, but incorporate judo as an element that isn't overlooked in jujitsu where, you know, you could be well-rounded and, and learn takedowns that are efficient in the gi or without the gi rather mm -hmm. than having to, to focus on, you know, pulling guard or, or doing these other things that might be dangerous for you or your opponent. You learn how to fall, you learn how to grip, you learn how to be comfortable with two hands on the gi or, or tying up with two hands and these elements and concepts that are really important that I think are overlooked in traditional jujitsu or Brazilian jujitsu where um, they're, they're kind of like nonchalantly shown in a way through warmups maybe. And then it's like onto, to rolling where it's, I think it's important to keep these disciplines separate, but train both of them. And if you are going to train just jujitsu, make sure to focus on falling and, and throwing and takedowns that aren't dangerous, you know, where you're not sitting on people's knees or jumping with closed guard or doing things that are desperate and kind of cowardice acts in my opinion. So. Mm, yeah. It's, it's an interesting point. And we wanted to ask actually what your thoughts were in regard to like where to start. Um, obviously you're now a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt as well. And you can maybe tell us, you know, how you got onto that at some point shortly as well. But 
Yeah, just just based on what you said, like, you know, do you think judo is the, the best place to start, or do you think jujitsu, or is it cross training? Like, what what would you suggest now? You've got insight across all three disciplines. Well, I'm biased, but I, I do understand, you know, the overlap of the Venn diagram and what's in the center. You know, what are the, the what's the core competency here if we're talking grappling only? And I think for developmenting developmental reasons, I think judo is the best to start with because there are elements of groundwork that are important. You pass the guard, you, you pin, you're able to hold someone down. You're able to take someone down safely. You're able to learn how to fall. Well, um, kids also it's unless you have a really, you know, uh, disciplined and non ABB, attention span it's very difficult to have kids learn these stagnant positions on the ground they want to be running around and tripping each other and grabbing onto each other and wrestling from their feet so i think that's a great place to start with your coordination on your feet your athleticism how you fall safely you tuck your chin you slap the mat you let go with one hand these things if you're taught those things first you'll be with you forever Whereas in jujitsu, those are overlooked at a young age sometimes, unless, you know, it's, I'm speaking generally, of course, there's mm. so many different schools with so many different theories, but generally what I've seen and what I've witnessed uh, is that judo is a great framework to start no matter what grappling journey you want to end up on. Cause you're, you're for wrestling, you're, you're flat footed, you're in a low stance, you only learn forward and backwards how to sprawl or shoot where you don't learn how to dynamically twist your hips. So turning and rotating your hips is not an element that's really taught. And it's more of a, a risk because you're showing your back possibly. But if you know how to do it well, it's, it's easy. It's just an element that's overlooked. And you see the best Russians and Dagestani wrestlers do that all the time. They, they throw, they, they set traps. They understand the full game. It's not just like, ready, go. Hit your head against the wall a hundred times until you break your opponent. And that's more the American style. <laughs> so, you know, if you take and extrapolate the important elements from each discipline, wrestling, geo, and jujitsu, I think what overlaps in the center of that Venn diagram is what is most important. And those, you can do those in every discipline. It's just trying to understand the grips versus the no grips for Giva and Nogi or understand like where do you score the points on the takedown for the throw? Is it the control afterwards or is it the actual back exposure? But you could still do the same throws. It's just kind of refining for each discipline. So like a lot of my MMA fighters, they have a, a background in one of the disciplines usually, and it's how to like lead them to their best self. If they're super tall, I'm not going to have them do drop Sanonagis. Or if they're short, I'm not going to have them do Uchimadas. So it's it's kind of based on their core competencies and their strengths and weaknesses. So kind of, I enjoy it all. You know, I, I'm a fan of all grappling disciplines, Sambo, Sumo, whatever. It's just like what works for me doesn't work for other people. So, and I appreciate pulling guard. It's just doing it in a way that's safe. I'm not going to impede my my opponent or training partner's livelihood by tearing their acl because i'm desperately scared to stand for three seconds so the first sign of fear of them attacking i sit on their ankle or knee mm -hmm. so it's like getting comfortable in your own skin is the first step is being able to like hold on with two hands tie up move around and understand that you know you don't have to just fall to your butt at the first sign of an attack by your opponent yeah, completely agree. Well, you always well, start on me, mate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking to a guard puller here, Justin. So, uh. <laughs> when I go against really big people, I go shin to shin, you know, so I uh, sit right down. It's all good. Usually, there's a feeling out process or an arm drag or a snap first just to get a good sense of who they are. If I do tie up with them, they might sit first, which is fine. But if things get a little scary for me, I'm preserving my body, but I want to do that safely. You know, I'm not going to, I, I tore all. Mine's just through, through lack of knowledge. I've only been doing jiu-jitsu for 18 months. So for me, it's like, I don't know. I just don't know anything about it. So I'm not going to mm. not gonna really do it. I do a bit of wrestling if I can. but Self-preservation is the number one most important key theme with all these things. So it's like, how do you protect yourself first? Mm. Then how do you protect your partner too? You know, I don't want – I've had a plenty of 
high level athletes tear their ankles and knees up because someone was just kind of scared, you know, and that's just, you got to know who you're training with as well. Yeah, hundred percent. And where we train, we, we have, we actually have really good judo. Um, we've got GB level judo, uh, at our academy. So we're, we're quite fortunate to have some really good guys. Uh, but you're right with what you said earlier. I think in the jujitsu, some of the, you know, sort of basics and the crossovers, like you said, are kind of just, just brushed over very quickly. Um, and I guess we do have the opportunity to then go and do judo separately. Um, and then obviously sort of gel them together, I guess, you know, sort of off your own back. And then just going back to um, my question around which one's better, and we kind of talked about, I guess, or we kind of assumed that we were talking about children and coming in from a young age, but they're a little bit bouncy and don't break as easy. If you've got a 40-year-old man coming into grappling, would you have the same answer, do you think? Or would you maybe think more just pulling guard and sitting down for a bit of jiu-jitsu is a better option? No, I mean, I think judo can be trained safely for older gentlemen or, or people that want to kind of come into it late. I just think it should start at a different place. I think you should start with grip, grips, kumikata, how, where to put your hands, how to make someone else make a mistake and controlling someone by having two hands inside grip, sleeve lapel. These things are universal for no matter what age you are, how to kind of get someone to, to almost pigeonhole your opponent so you can play your game. But if you don't know what your game is and sitting down is your game, also that's the same rule set. You should be able to grip fight before you sit down so you're putting yourself in the best guard rather than I'm just going to sit down and hopefully they don't pass. If you're able to pass an elbow and sit or get to a comfortable deep half or shin to shin or make it so you have the best chance to come up and sweep on top or, or submit from the bottom, that should be the goal. And I think there's sacrifice moves in judo that lead really well into that. Sumi Gaishi, Tomoe Nagi, these throws that you're able to like safely put yourself down in front of your partner where you can sweep them and break their balance with good kazushi. So, yes, jujitsu, I think, is overall better for a new grappler to start just because it's safer and there's a lot more of a community here, at least in the United States for that, where, you know, judo clubs are a little more far and few between, and they exist more within jujitsu academies these days, just because the economics of it, it's hard. Uh, most of, you know, the old model where judo academies existed in Japanese cultural centers or rec centers, or, you know, were almost given for free. It, it, it's not as, it's not as, capitalistic in its endeavors as far as the culture. And I think that's changing. I'm, tr I'm hoping just based on, you know, there is a need and a want and a desire for it. So I think dojo owners should treat themselves to, you know, the rates that jujitsu academies do and, and they deserve it because there's a skill there that's lacking in grappling. And yeah, so Kind of the long-winded answer is jujitsu. I think is safer for older folks that want to kind of commit to a martial art. It just depends on the style and who you go with and the people that you you join the academy. You know, it, some cultures are a little bit rough as far as like the way they train. You know, they'll say, "Hey, your first day, go with this person who's done it four years and is a purple belt, and go kick their ass." Where it's like. Uh, maybe they need like a three month intro course where they understand who they are on the mat rather than just putting them with someone who knows what they're doing. And that's hard. You know, you get a lot of these, these bigger academies like Gracie Baja who have that well oiled machine where they have like your intro class, then they have your beginners class, then they have your ex uh, experienced advanced class. Then they have those kids that the beginner kids, then they have the, you know, nine and unders and they have so that is great. That is like the formula that works. I think it's just, you need to build that over time. So, you know, you're successful enough to create an environment that's safe for all sorts of different groups, you know, women's self-defense, all these different genres within jujitsu that can ex coexist separately in the same building rather than like, all right, it's class time. There's a hundred people on the mat and it's a free for all. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. I think, uh, I think obviously a lot of academies maybe don't have the, the bandwidth to do that, but I think the ones that do, I think, uh, yeah, that sounds like a good model. Um, going back to your um, competition days, mate. So obviously you talked us uh, up to that point where you kind of sort of 
get into university now as a wrestler and a judoka. What was your uh, your your biggest achievement or highest achievement as a as a competitor? Huh. So I can look back on my career and say that I didn't reach my potential. Definitely, as far as um, you know, I had beaten some of the best players in the world in uh, wrestling and judo, and it was just really difficult sometimes because I. I had a lot of knee injuries, uh, maybe 15 knee surgeries. Uh, I've had six ACL tears, MCL reconstruction. I have no PCLs or ACLs at the moment. I've had my right knee completely reshaped as far as um, bone grafts uh, because I have so many osteophytes that they've had to take out and kind of reset my, my tibia and my fibia and compact it. And I've had stem cells multiple times, high allegan, synbisc, all these magic serums that basically just lead me to the same place, you know, arthritis and lack of stability. But uh, that was always an issue I was dealing with, you know, since I was 16, I tore my ACL. Mm -hmm. But that never stopped my drive and, and my my desire to be the best in the world. So um I, I won the U.S. Nationals multiple times, the U.S. Open, the, the North American Championships. I was a medalist at the Pan American Championships. I uh, went to Europe and I medaled in Europe when no other Americans really were doing that um, at the time. So all these big Grand Prix, Grand Slam events that, that happen now, I was always in the mix, in the hunts, making the semifinals, but just falling short of, of winning these events to lose to the guy who took second at the Olympics or world champions, but just barely, I was, I was right there. And I think a big part of that is I didn't, I wasn't able to, and we talked about this a little bit. I didn't have the specialized need or care that I, all my opponents did. I, I went to wrestling, which is different than judo. And mm-hmm. it took away from, I think if I would have stuck with judo, I would have, made that big jump when I was 18 to 21, which is the most pivotal age in judo where you see like these people that I would beat when I was 18, they were the next crop that won the Olympics or won the world championships. Yorandis Arancibia from Cuba. Good example. I beat him in the junior Pan American semifinals pretty easily. And within two years, he was in the finals of the world championships. Um, And there's a lot of markers like that where I, Mm -hmm. I, as a junior 17, 18, I was beating these people that, you know, three, four years later, we're winning the European championships or winning the world championships. And I went to wrestling as like a way to get my education paid for. And because my brother was the number one judoka in the U S the weight above me, but I could have probably made the weight and gone to the Olympics in 2000 who I beat the American who went and he took seventh place at the Olympics. Mm-hmm. So I, I mean, it was almost not indecision. It was just, if I would have just buckled down maybe and focused on my core competency, which was judo, not wrestling, I think I probably would have had a better statistical career than I did. Um, But sitting where I am now today with all the experience of multiple disciplines and the breadth of knowledge that those disciplines instilled in me, it just made me a better coach overall in mixed martial arts, wrestling, jujitsu, judo, I was still able to be the Olympic team coach. So that filled a little void and was like cathartic in a way because I didn't get to go to the Olympics as an athlete. I was the alternate in 2004 and I'd beaten the athlete who went nine times. I think I beat him, but on the day of the Olympic trials, it just didn't go my way. I was really kind of a sad story. Uh, I, I went against a guy named Alex Atiana, who I have a lot of respect for. He, he was amazing judoka. He was, top 15 in the world. And he, um, me and him battled it out at the trials. And in the last match of our, uh, you know, what did we have? I won the first one. I won the second one. Then he won the third one. And it came down to this last match at the trials. Um, because since he was the number one seed, he had the, the best of two out of three on his side where I had to beat him in the tournament, which was a five man bracketed tournament. And since I beat him, I forced the two out of three. And then that first match I won, the second match I lost. And then the last match, about halfway through, I came in for a, like a, a Yoko Satemi Waza, like a fireman's carry almost. And he turned away as I did it. And I landed on my head. 
and I got a concussion and I herniated two discs in my neck and I got a really bad stinger, but I was out cold for, I don't know, five, 10 seconds, I guess. Um, and I came to, and when I came to, you know, the referee gave him the win and I was busy at the time. I don't have a clear memory of it, but, um, I guess the rule was since the doctor came out who the doctor was a friend of mine, the, the, the Matt side doctor, he came out and he touched my shoulder, uh, when I was down. Um, and I'm not saying I could have came back and won the match, but I would have done my darndest. I, I definitely would have gotten up and done anything in my power to win that last match. And I have been concussed before in matches and came back. I mean, it's, that's not like I'm bragging. It's just part of the sport of wrestling and judo. <laughs> yeah. You and you just are what? I don't remember the match. It's like, you wrestled the best match of your life. You don't remember that? <laughs> um, so in this case, the doctor touched me and he's a family friend. I, I was dealing with neck injuries prior to that. And I, I, he knew that. So as a friend, he came out and touched me, but the rule was that's considered a manipulation. If he touched me, I'm disqualified from the match. So I stood up and they gave Alex the win and he was the Olympian. And I had to deal with, you know, the what ifs for, you know, the rest of my life, basically. So, uh, you know, it's something I had a really hard time with grappling with mentally. And, uh, you know, I fell into depression and I really had no desire to to do anything in life for a while there other than just feel sorry for myself but i was able to kind of pick myself up by my bootstraps and i had a lot of support from my family and i kind of continued on my journey uh about six months later i took off and i was you know kind of at the bottom rung of i gained about 30 pounds i was about 180 pounds and i didn't have much direction other than like you know a lot of injuries <laughs> so I kind of revamped my life. I, I found, you know, meaning in other things and developed skills in other areas. And I went back to school and I finished school and I had, you know, a little bit different motivating factors going into that next quadrennial till 2008. So I, you know, I, I think I became a, just a better person in general because I only saw one way, you know, I had, very like blinders on up until that moment, because all I knew was the wins and the losses. And it's very binary, you know, black and white, where when you grow up and you learn things, you learn, it's a little bit more gray, these areas where, you know, you can extrapolate a lot of information, both positive and negative out of the gray areas rather than, well, you lost. So that's it. So I had to kind of seek solace in that. And I had to, you know, do positive self-talk and understand that there's more to life than these wins and losses, even though the 24 year old me can only see, you know, that I was a failure. So I, I had a hard time, but all in all, it taught me a lot about myself and, you know, the sport, the sport life, uh, combat sports. And I think that definitely made me a more in touch coach like I am today where I could, I can see a lot into an athlete's life based on, you know, where they are and their emotional side and what they need rather than just like, Hey, you want to get the win? This is the way it's like, well, there's other ways to skin a cat, you know? Yeah, definitely. I can imagine it must've been so tough, mate, because that would have been your whole identity up to that point, wouldn't it? So, you know, so having a broken body as well and, and, and kind of that, I guess that big goal or opportunity being gone. When did you find jujitsu? Was that around that time or was that a bit later on? Well, I had always kind of frequented uh, jujitsu academies in my 20s, and I'm 44 now, so this is the early 2000s. Um, I I grew up with a lot of high-level jujitsu competitors that did judo, because in the early 90s when I was doing judo, uh, late 80s, there was an influx of you know Brazilians that came here to start you know put their flag in the sand and start their academy, the Machados, the Gracies, and. Um, I used to travel and compete a lot with the Camarillo brothers, Dave and Dan Camarillo. Um, I went to Japan with them when I was nine years old. Um, but they, I would, you know, I always had an affinity for groundwork. So I, I had, uh, you know, chokes and arm bars and triangles kind of dialed in, but I didn't have like a well-rounded game. I had a very offensive game where I get on top and I work my game and it'll usually work. Um, so, you know, I had some rude awakenings going into jujitsu academies where it was more long form, where it's, you know, a 10 minute roll where you, at some point you're going to end up out of position. 
And that was, those were things I really hadn't dealt with. I was always kind of, you know, winning or against my brother. There was different, you know, he would kind of beat me up, but I really had to fill in those gaps. And I wasn't, I wouldn't say it was till, you know, the mid, mid 2015, probably 2014 that I started kind of developing a longer form jujitsu game. Um, so I started training Rhonda around that time and, um, wrestling and judo, you know, no gi stuff is what we would work. And because she was very protected as far as like her body, uh, obviously she didn't want to get injuries from people that are just random that mm. are try, trying to use her as a proving ground. Um, so she didn't get the bodies and the looks that she needed. I took it upon myself to start training jujitsu. So just so, so she could get more looks and to just become more well-rounded in general. So I started to go to studio 540 in Solana beach where there was a, you know, a high level, a plethora of high level competitors, you know, Majin Page and Joel Tudor and a lot of other black belts. And, um, I started developing a game that was a little bit, you know, more technical from a side where it's like I could get out of position and still find ways to incorporate offense and defense together rather than just being on, which, you know, you blow a gasket after 30 seconds. Um, so Fabio Santos was one of the instructors there and he's an OG, uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu professor here in San Diego, who was part of like the Gracie train who would go out with Hoist Gracie and UFC one, two, three, four. And he has a, a, an academy here in San Diego, but he taught at studio 540. So I think the first time I took his class, I was 24. 15 maybe and uh usually all the black belts there would just tell me to wear my judo gi and black belts because they had a, a high amount of respect for who i was on yeah, that yeah. but i always felt a little bit like a fraud so yeah. in this class I, I wore white belts okay. and after, after the class he gave me a purple belt and then um i went to his academy maybe three or four times in the interim in the next few months because he's a kind of a hike and then he gave me a brown belt after then. And then I sat up round belt for a while and I learned some things that were really important um, within that, you know, just to get out of position and let people, you know, work my way out of things rather than just like always winning. And I had a really yeah. important conversation with, when, with him once because I was tapping all of his black belts in front of him. And I think a couple of years had gone by at brown belt. So it's maybe three years into, you know, starting jujitsu officially. And this is maybe 20. 19 um and he was like you got to get out of position you got to get you got to let people get on top of you let people mount you let people get inside control let them get you in submission attempts where you got to work your way out it was kind of like revolutionary at that moment because i was asking what do i i didn't ask him what do i need to do to get black belts it's like what do you see that i can work on and he mm -hmm. just shot it to me straight Cause I mean, there was no one that was touching me in there. Um, so I did that and it was painful. I mean, my, <laughs> my knees, everything, you know, my worst position is in someone's clothes guard. It's like, I'm happy in Seiza. I have to be on my knees, like deep on my knees, like butt to feet, which is impossible for me. I have so much scar tissue. I can't bend my knees. So from there, it's like almost easier for me to like pull them into mount or turn and give them my back. So I started <laughs> different ways to just like, okay, I'll, uh, Wilson Hayes taught me a really cool Sao Paulo pass where I could sit out with an underhook and kind of work on the feet safely. Or JJ Wilson taught me a cool way to go to my butt and flip my feet over their chest to break their, their guard, that closed guard lock, and then I could work. So it's like developing all these other ways around things that maybe weren't so conventional, just my body won't allow me to do the conventional. And I think he saw that. And then one day, I, I think it was 2020, right before COVID, he uh, gave me his black belt after one of the, the classes. Just I, I was, you know, I guess impressive en of enough for him that day. But um, it did teach me a lot. And I have a lot to be thankful for in that regard, because instead of just mowing on, I you know took a few steps back and let people put me in the worst positions I could be in, which was super painful. But, you know, we're all now... You know, I remember rolling with Isaac Dordelin, uh maybe a year ago. And I mean, I was only in bad position with him because he's amazing. And I was able to get out of all of it just based on like, okay, you know, grab the hand, do whatever I needed to do. And he's like, wow, that was 
what I would imagine it would be like rolling with Jeff Glover, where, you know, it's just you're made of like, you know, fluidity rather than this rigid thing where you're forcing stuff. And that was like mm-hmm. one of the biggest compliments I've ever had, you know, just. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. And, that's, a, that's pretty cool. I didn't have to force anything. And sure, you know, I probably could have tried to be more offensive, but I really did want to feel what he had because he's the, you know, the world champ at the moment about my weight. So it was kind of a, a really good eye into how I've grown rather than just trying to force everything and throw, you know, an AK 47 of bullets, you know, it's like more tactical and timing based and picking my moments rather than just a barrage of offense. Yeah, that's sick, man. And then you've obviously moved across into coaching. So you mentioned that you'd been working with Ronda already at this point. So so how did you make that switch from from being a competitor and then sort of maybe moving away from it for a bit to, to, to then coming back as a coach? Tell us about that. Yeah, I took maybe three years off after I competed. In 2008, um, I moved with my now wife to Philadelphia and I got – like a normal nine to five. Um, I kind of really wasn't doing much as far as anything on the mat. Maybe once in a blue moon, I'd put my gi on and go to the local judo club in Philadelphia, Liberty Bell judo. And uh, I kind of needed that space, I think, just to kind of get my life in in order and to understand capitalism because it was something I was, you know, delaying. Mm Mm-hmm all costs based on like, well, I'm going to keep competing. And then, you know, I was 28 and I think the best years were behind me. So it was time to kind of hang that up. And I did it at the right time where I still probably could have pushed on and, and, but I definitely plateaued. So it's like, if I'm not going to keep getting better. I don't see why I would continue on, you know, just that would be more about my ego than about becoming more enriched. And, and I think it's more complacent. So I, I started my own graphic design company where I had an internship at an advertising agency in Philadelphia where I learned the ins and outs of, you know, the software for graphic designing and, and how sales work and account management. And so I kind of just did that. I, I worked and I was able to start by, I had a three child or children's books I illustrated, which got me my start. And then I, I kind of started doing branding within the jujitsu community and judo community where um, I worked for Fuji Sports for about eight years doing all their graphic design needs. So there's a lot of like the, the rash guard Joe Rogan was promoted into black belts. I designed it. It was like this. Fame <laughs> to fame. Yeah. <laughs> um, so like That's I, cool. I kind of I had a lot of good connections within those worlds. So I used them for, you know, what I knew next, which was I, I had an affinity for illustration and I learned how to use the software. So I was making logos, T-shirts and and uh, kind of a sidebar on that. I, I When I started coaching Rhonda, I was just, you know, her personal coach. I didn't have like a career in this mm. space. So all these people I was surrounded with that Rhonda had chosen to her inner circle like Mike Dolce and Henner and Huron Gracie, Henner and Huron Gracie, I I would be on trips with them to Brazil, Australia, Las Vegas, wherever we would go for her fights or training camps, and they would need graph design work. So I was designing for I did all the Olavanka work for for the Gracies when they kind of moved over from like using Gracie University and Gracie Academy for their merchandising. They switched over to Olavanka, which means leverage. I did their logo and design work. And Mike Dolce, I laid out his books and did his T-shirt design. And and then one and Rhonda, I did her logo. So I was kind of like the guy behind the scenes as far as like. You know, as training partner, coach, graph designer. <laughs> That's fucking so random, isn't it? <laughs> like, I've, got, I've got one of Dolce's books as well, mate. I can, uh, yeah, it's good work. <laughs> and um, and then one day, Rhonda's mom was like, "Justin, what are you doing? Like, I get you have these talents, but why don't you do this for yourself? Why don't you make yourself the brand rather than doing this for everyone else?" And uh, you know. I think being in a judo background um, is a little less, it's a little less, you know, self aggrandizing where, you know, look at me, everyone. I did all these things because in judo it's, there's a little bit more respect and I find it a little cringy sometimes to just 
to yell my name from the top of a mountain, which, you know, in some other sports like jujitsu is a little more normal. It's just mm-hmm. self promotion and these things that I really didn't see myself doing. And, and being, you know, roommates with Henner and here on Gracie for weeks on end in other countries, you know, some of that rubbed off on me as far as like, uh, maybe there is a little bit to be said about selling and, and marketing yourself and, you know, not, maybe not to that level, but something that, that I could, you know, not, <laughs> I could still be proud of in a way where I just don't feel like I'm selling out. I'm not saying that's what they're doing. I'm just saying it's hard for me sometimes it was to, to be that guy. It's usually like other people will mention my name because they think I'm worthy of X, Y, and Z rather than myself do it. And the world doesn't really work that way, you know, especially if you're a judoka because people a lot of times, and maybe this is me just being like, judo gets the short end of the stick sometimes as far as the grappling culture, uh, you know, people like to knock it a little bit because for whatever reason, you know, judo um, within this jujitsu space doesn't get the credit it deserves. I feel like the foundations which jujitsu was built on is all because of judo, but that history has been lost. And I think there's mm-hmm. things of like that coming back into like the historical viewpoint because people have brought that in and say, yeah, it's all judo. You know, it's just been rebranded. And I do believe that. Uh, sure, it's BJJ is its own thing, and I respect that. But it's all because of judo, and I think a lot of that history has been lost. And being a judoka, that mentality isn't about like, no, no, judo is the answer. I'm the guy. We're the thing. It's the best. I mean, I think the results will show for themselves. And I don't want to be that person who's going to yell from a mountaintop about how great I am or how about great judo is but I've developed a way to, tr- to angle my brand to kind of speak for itself in that regard where I'm not trying to pick fights with jujitsu or, or wrestlers. Cause I think all of it, there's unification in all of it. Like I said before, with the, the overlapping of the Venn diagram where you have all these disciplines that exist separate, but the overlap, what works the best is usually the same movements. So it's like where that those core competencies are, is what I focus on. And sure, when you're, you know, balls deep into a discipline, you're going to have to know every nuance and movement that exists within grip fighting, where some of that's, you can, you can leave in jujitsu with a gi or in wrestling. You don't need to know all the, all the elements of hand fighting when you're doing no gi grappling, because the stance is different. The goals are different. So if you're like really specialized in one of the disciplines, you have to know everything you do. It's really hard to just be a jack of all trades and a master of none. So that's where I exist a little bit, where I love how all of them work together in their own disciplines, and I want to train all everything, but I'm a judo cut heart. So that's where, that's where my heart lies, and that's what I, my focus usually ends up going back to, or at least that's what I was taught. You know, the, the concepts within judo, maximum efficiency, minimal effort. If I feel like I'm, I'm engaging too hard into a certain situation, I'll, I'll step back a little bit and kind of let the work come to me so I could counter, you know, you could take that adage and apply it to mixed martial arts or no gi grappling or jujitsu in a gi or judo. So like I said, you know, those concepts, kind of those themes is what I kind of like to live by within the space of jujitsu or wrestling or MMA grappling too. Yeah, no, I think I like it. And I think it feels like certainly post lockdown the UFC's obviously exploded now I think it's always been very popular in the US and in the UK but I think for even non-martial artists now it's it's a, it's a massive spectator sport isn't it and it feels like grappling's kind of gone that way a little bit as well I think you're right I think maybe because people are seeing the benefit of mixing martial arts definitely yeah and now they're kind of just seeing that in grappling as well and I think you it does feel like where in the past, I think the martial arts might have been more siloed. It does feel that people just have an acceptance now that you can take a bit from everything. It's just grappling now, isn't yeah. it? A lot of people are just exactly. grappling, you know. And my hope would be someday that jujitsu and judo unify. And if it is ever going to be an Olympic endeavor for jujitsu, those should become one thing. That'd be so cool, wouldn't it? That'd be so cool. You add control to Nawaza, the scoring might be adjusted a little bit, but. I mean, I just don't see the Olympics being, I mean, if it is the standard and the, the zenith of sports, the pinnacle, um, 
I don't know if jujitsu is big enough of a sport in the global sphere of how many countries participate within Mm -hmm. they have a national governing body. I don't know how many countries do, but if these sports were to unify decades into the future, I wouldn't be against it because it just would become more well-rounded, but I get why they are separate now. Like to preserve the, the arts is, is really important, but it doesn't mean there can't be something where these things are a little bit more synergistic in their rule sets. But You know, I I do think the meta is changing a little bit from maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, where judo, you know, where I think that's what kind of left a bad taste in my mouth at some of those experiences where there's a lack of respect or understanding Mm -hmm. where I felt like, okay, this is my mission. I want to validate and justify the years of training I've done and show that it does work within these other grappling arts. And, you know, maybe I'm it's coming from the wrong place, but I do think that, you know, maybe a little chip on my shoulder from those experiences has led me to where I am now. Mm. Yeah. We had uh, Owen Livesey on the podcast uh, a couple of months back. You have so much respect. Yeah. Super cool guy, but he was saying a lot of the same stuff, but he, he kind of, we had a, we had a clip that um, did quite well where he was talking about the lack of respect for judo. Um, and he was talking specifically more around the actual athletes themselves Yeah, and the, the, the level of conditioning they've got and, how good they were, how yeah. good they were, like compared yeah. to jiu-jitsu athletes. Yeah, and I think he's noted uh, for jumping into quite a few grappling competitions fairly last minute and, and kind of half-assing his training. Mm-hmm. And he was quite candid about the fact that if he'd done that in judo, he wouldn't have made it out of a round. Oh, yeah. I had so many events where it's like I'm coming right off of an injury and I didn't train well, but I got the opportunity, so I went. And I'd do pretty good, but I couldn't make it past the second or third round just based on the cardio that's needed the the training that's needed to function at that level that's yeah that was usually the case for some of my you know bad performances but yeah Mm. i think that's the case for a lot of people you know if they only understood how much work goes into it and i've trained at the highest level of university college level wrestling and i've trained at the highest level of judo and there's no difference i mean sure the sport rules are different but what's needed the the lifestyle the diet the, the the type of commitment it's the same. And, and everyone says nothing's harder than wrestling. So, I mean, it's a step sideways. Mm. Yeah, yeah, 100%. So with your coaching hat on then, Justin, so what are your like, non-negotiables with, with, with your athletes? Like, what do you think makes, like, what, would make, what makes a world champion? You know, what, what makes them different to just your, your hobbyist? What are the attributes? Well, I think everyone that I've coached is, is freakishly talented. They have their their own attributes that makes them unique and special. But the ones that are even set apart further from that is their not only desire to win, like at all costs in every element of what they do, whether it's playing checkers, whether it's playing basketball in the backyard, every element is a competition where it's like they don't give an inch. And sometimes that makes miserable friendships, but <laughs> – I mean, that's what sets those people apart. I think, Mm -hmm. you know, like that's, is their, they're striving to win at all costs, whether it's Mm -hmm. to their own detriment physically, but they got the win. I've known a lot of those athletes where, you know, the Dominic Cruz's, Ronda Rousey's, these types, they're not giving an inch. If they're, if they're losing in the rule set that, that you said, that I said as a coach, they'll flip the game board over and change the rules and do something that's illegal because they want to (laughs) win. (laughs) <laughs> and that doesn't make me happy, but it's like, I get it. That's what makes them great. And I'm never going to change that about those people. It's like, I got to almost like reshape things or maybe make it a safe space for the, the training environment for them. But that's something that that's going to make them successful, the most successful. And some people just don't have that. Like, you know, I knew when I lost that it was time to hang it up. Mm-hmm. So you know, I'm not saying those are things that last forever with these athletes, but in their heyday, that's definitely what sets them apart. And that's something that's instilled from a young age. It's something that comes from maybe a dark place. That's something that's just unique to them, however they got there, whether it's a, a bitter place or if it's something that, you know, they have a chip on their shoulder or it's just they know they're the best in, intrinsically that they're not going to take no for an answer. They're going to win. And that's mm-hmm. usually it. I mean, you know, my brother wasn't the most successful in the competition side. 
but he was definitely the most talented. And if he would have had some of that, some of like, I'm the best. I don't care what anyone says. I'm going to prove it to the world. He would, if he had some of that, he would have been an Olympic champion. And I, you know, I always took like, Jacob, wow. He would just be like, well, you know, I, I, I just like it when the match is over kind of thing. <laughs> I think you just he got he got too complacent kicking your ass growing up by the sound of it. I think that was it, right? Maybe, but you know, it drove, <laughs> drove me to madness. You know, it drove yeah, yeah. Yeah, I me at everything. So um, yeah, I would say that's what sets most people apart. You know, and other people have maybe other values that they lean on that they could create confidence out of. You know, whether it's tricking themselves or you know, it's such a psychological game at the highest mm-hmm. level. It's like, you know, these, these microseconds that determine who wins and loses or these small layers that are developed in training that are able to give someone confidence to win in the last minute of the last round. And it's different for everyone. It, it really is. Like whether they're super unique in their flexibility or they, they're, they're really explosive, these things. And it's that as a coach, I, I think I'm really good at, at having that pattern recognition and seeing what they're good at. And letting them know when to lean into those things or when to hold back or, or how to kind of gauge their, their like, you know, their gas in their tank, you know, whether they have eight spurts in a match, let's make sure we use those right. Let's not, you know, blow our wad in the first minute. So you have to create a whole style around who they are rather than, hey, this puzzle piece goes here. Paint by number, everyone's the same. Here's the system. And those are the, I get it if you have like a big school and you're trying to corral a herd of people, but at the highest levels, that's just not the case. It's almost like it has to be a little more boutique. So, you know, when I train different athletes at different times, I have to wear different hats, you know, it's like I have to be different personalities almost. Some people need a good kick in the butt and other people's need to be a little bit more coddled and, and understand that, you know, they're really talented, but they might not believe that. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So mindset's a massive factor then by the sound of it. Yeah. And when you, when you sort of talk about, you've worked with so many, so many, so many talented athletes, you know, are there kind of physical traits that you tend to see or do you find, do you find that talent comes in the way of their mindset? Oh, physical traits. Definitely. Like whether I can name a few that it's just, JJ Wilson, he, um, he's so, I mean, I, he's uh he was the number one contender in Bellator. He's a jujitsu black belt. I coached him for about three, four years. He, um, super talented. He's almost like my brother in the, the fact that he could see it and then do it. I, I've worked with him in the cage before a Bellator fight, showing him a new move. And then an hour later when we're, when he's fighting, he hit that new move against the cage. He was just <laughs> like, I literally warmed him up teaching him something. And then an hour later he does it and wins the fight based on that move. Mm. And that's like something that I, I, you know, I wish I could bottle up and force feed the other students where it's just to have an open enough, they're receptive enough, mm. whether, you know, they're intelligent in different ways, but his physical attributes where he's really long and flexible. So he had a good fighter's body, you know, he, he, he didn't have to just get to the inside. He could keep you at distance. And if you wanted to get to the inside, he could throw you. And then once on the ground, he had great submission. So he was really well-rounded. Yeah. And you, you touched on his body type then. Do you think there's a, an optimal body type for grappling? Do you think it's a longer body? I think so. Based on leverage, just, you know, flexibility, if you could have those characteristics, sure. There's, there's something to be said about being really explosive and being able to cut through things in a way. But I think the rule set for jujitsu and grappling, it's harder to get away with that and be super successful. Whereas in wrestling and judo, you could win based on like two seconds of movements that are like, put you flat on your back or pin you to your back for a second. So, you know, just by the rule set alone, sure, it'll get you so far, but then you have to develop a game. You have to develop a full spectrum system around your physical attributes, where I think for MMA, you could be super explosive if you have that one knockout, one punch knockout power. 
It was a matter of time. <laughs> <laughs> we did well. That was nearly an hour without <laughs> that a bike. <laughs> So, so yeah, but I, I do think like the rangy, lanky, flexible, coordinated body bodes the best, but doesn't mean, you know, you see all shapes and sizes. Look at Daniel Cormier. Look at, you know, it, it, it's more related to your mindset and how confident you are. Like I said earlier, that's like the most unique factor that usually sets the championship mentality, though, those types apart. Yeah. Definitely, it's definitely mindset, isn't it? Yeah, and, and long arms. And my, my, mind, mindset and long arms. Yeah, it has to be based on reality, though. It can't be like, you know, self-delusion. That only takes some... <laughs> I bet you get a lot of that as well, don't you? <laughs> You'd be surprised, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine, yeah. I, I think I heard, I think it was John Danaher who was talking about... Um, where he doesn't believe in like visualization um, and sort of sports psychology because he believes that you gain that confidence by, you know, stacking up the kind of wins and, and creating that self-assurance on the mat. Do you agree with that? Or do you think there is a place for, you know, for a good pep talk and, and getting people in the right mindset? Can you think you can teach like confidence? Well, I think through trial and error, yes, but I do agree with that partially. I think where I would not disagree, but I would add a caveat is if you compete a lot, you're going to go through peaks and valleys. There's no, I mean, there's no one who just wins every match. No one, not Gordon Ryan. I've seen him lose and he doesn't compete a lot. So he can pick and choose when he competes. If you're in the game and you're competing a hundred times a year, match wise, you're going to have down. You're going to have slumps, just like baseball, like any sport. I mean, even though it's a combat sport we're talking about here, you're going to go through lulls based on injuries, based on your personal life. And those are moments where you need to kind of like retrace what made you great and also know you're you're always evolving and you're a different person. So what worked for you three, three years ago and you're successful isn't necessarily going to work with you in the future based on who you are now, how the game has changed on the outside of you how things have evolved, uh, injuries you have to kind of work around. You can't just like beat your head in the same spot except expecting to go through that wall. You're going to have to adapt and improvise to overcome. So I do think the psychological part of it, it does help to to work things out, you know, verbally or, Mm. or understanding yourself better. And that's like usually that happens in the latter half of your career. You know, you can... Ignorance is bliss. You can work through things just by out of sheer ignorance and being naive to the fact that there's a whole psychological element to it that you haven't been exposed to yet because things are working great for you because you haven't had any setbacks, whether it's injury or personal life. And when those happen, things are hard to move forward in the same way they were. So yes, you do have to kind of like deal with those things before and confront those things before you think you could be successful again mm. in the same way. So I've had to deal with that. I know other athletes that have had to deal with that to see sports, sports psychiatrists or just get in with their coach and talk to them on d- different levels and understand each other better. So, you know, maybe what you tell, you know, Joe over there won't work for me because I'm in a different place. So it's, you know, that one size fits all approach. Like we talked about earlier, doesn't really work sometimes based on like people's triggers or what, what motivates them. Everyone's different at the highest level. So yes, I do get like confidence comes from wins, but that's kind of primitive thinking. I think at the highest levels in sports where there's a lot of competition, where you're competing constantly like judo and wrestling, where you have three weigh-ins a week sometimes in wrestling, we have a, a competition every weekend in judo where it's much more dense. There's more people mm. competing at the higher levels. There's peaks and valleys. There's no way you're going to win everything. There's no way. So maybe in this, you know, ADCC world that he's speaking of or, or no gi grappling where you do a match here and a match there and they're spread out by months. Okay. Yeah, I get that because it's mm. different. But in, you know, the broader world of grappling, which mm. I'm talking about wrestling, judo, as well as like even MMA, you're, you might be competing more. So you have to deal with these different variables in a way that's more psychology based than just like, let's get our work in, let's run our four miles a day. Let's do our 10 rounds. You know, sometimes it doesn't work. 
Yeah, no, I think that makes sense. Mate, it sounds like a hell of a job being a coach, <laughs> yeah, doesn't it? Because you've got, you've got a, a, a sort of absolute raft of different personalities. Yeah. And I, you know, I've, I've, in some of my sort of jobs, I've, I've worked with teams of people and, and managing personalities on its own is, is tough. And then you've obviously got the training to contend with. You've got the psychology, you've got nutrition. What do you think's harder? Is it, was it being a competitor, breaking your body, or is it probably pulling your hair out as a coach? What do you think? Well, I think what's been hardest as a coach, um, is, like you noted, the personalities and, and, you know, getting pulled different ways within those athletes. But everything I've done as a coach, I've been a father at the same time. So I have two kids um, and managing, you know, my home life as well as life on the road, coaching athletes. That's been very difficult. Like, you know, athletes that are fighting usually expect you to be the loyal one who's there for all of fight week, who needs all these things for them and their confidence. And I get why they need that because I was there once too. But for me, I just can't devote my time and resources the way I could have, like I did when I was an athlete. So I get it. If I didn't have kids, I'd probably be more like Mike Brown, where I'm at a PFL on a Thursday, a Bell tour on a Friday, a UFC on a Saturday, and we're in and repeat the next week. So I just... I've had to take some time and step back and only pick and choose the athletes I coach uh, with a fine tooth comb and, and really not like taking every opportunity and saying no a lot based on, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll teach you as a technician, but I can't get, I can't get locked up and rolled into that snowball of your athletic endeavors in your life. Because I mean, that was, you know, I could with Ron and I could with a few other athletes before I had kids, but the state I'm in now, um, I more want to be a, a technical advisor, if anything, mm-hmm. until my kids are a little older. And then I could, you know, be more inclined to, to say yes more for those things. I mean, I got soccer practice later this evening. I'm taking my son to judo. My daughter has gymnastics. These are just like real life things. Yeah, that yeah. Well, I think we missed our first date because I think your daughter was on well, wasn't it? So, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's an example right there. Yeah. So I would love to say yes to every opportunity. And, um, but I have to be really selective. So yes, it's difficult. It is difficult to be, you know, there for an athlete. Like just recently, um, Kat Zingano fought, um, Chris Cyborg. And on that same night I was coaching Liz Carmouche against Alima Le McFarland. It was uh, the last Bellator event in San Diego here. And, um, I have obligations at home and fight week. That fight week was rough. I had to be there for Kat. I had to be there for Liz. I had to mix all these things together. So I kind of told myself like, you know, after that one, I think I'm going to have to take a step back. So I've, I've kind of worked on, you know, what I'm doing and, and if athletes want to come to me and, and seek me out for privates, I'm fine with that. And I'll teach mm-hmm. my classes. I do at Legion, but as far as like, like being fully engulfed in, you know, all the elements and, and catering to them and making a, a schedule for them and a dietary plan and connecting them with their strength and conditioning coaches and making touching base with all their other coaches and having us come together and having everyone running as a well-oiled machine. I just don't have the time for it anymore. So I love doing that, but it's just not who I am at 44 years old anymore. And I'm not saying that time is over. I think it's a revolving door. I think as long as I stay involved and I understand the world that is combat sports, I think I could step back in fairly easy. But for now, I've, I have good assistants. I have Max Schneider. I have a couple other athletes that uh, I work with that like Max Schneider right now. I was at the World MMA Awards uh, about six weeks ago in Las Vegas and I was uh, having a drink with Eric Albersine, Captain America. He's Henry Cejudo's wrestling coach. And he's like, Justin, how do I get you to work with my fighters? Uh, Patricio Pitbull and his, his brother. I'm like, you know what? Here's Max Schneider. He's amazing. He's 10 years younger than me. He is an amazing wrestler, amazing judoka, all the skills that I have, he's the reincarnate version, but a little younger. And he's like my Padawan. And I mean, I don't mean that disrespectfully. He he's his own person and everything, but he's like, I take him to me with, with me to seminars. Uh, I, I just, I want to, to have him become something that could take over for what I've done 
and 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 now he's out in Florida with Pitbull right now, training him for his next fight. It's a PFL versus Bellator event that's going to be happening mm. in Europe. I think it's in Scotland or Ireland, maybe. But uh, so he's out there in training camp with them. So I think that's more what I'm going to do. I'm going to set up a network where I have athletes that can, or athletes that I coached even help mm-hmm. these younger athletes that want the kind of knowledge that I have to offer because I trust these people. And I, I've done that before with some of my female fighters where I've Leilani Akiyama, who's my brother's girlfriend who I opened up that judo dojo who wrestled as well as, you know, as, as a jujitsu purple belt and a high level judoka. She works with, She's worked with Meatball Molly. She's worked with Jessica Penne, Angela Hill, Jenna Bishop. So Liz Carmouche, all these fighters, Kaz and Gano. So I could, it's almost like me setting up the pieces rather than me being the person. Yeah, I think that's a good shout out, mate, because you can only be in so many places at once, right? Yeah. But I think if you create a network, then you can help a lot more athletes. So I think exactly. that's a great shout and, and of all the people that you're kind of um, associated with at the moment that you're, you've kind of worked with or that you, you've kind of supported through your network, who are the, the grapplers that you're most excited about at the moment, maybe from a, an MMA perspective and a, and a grappling perspective? Yeah. So, I mean, um, Patty, Patty Pimblett, um, he comes to San Diego every so often. Um, his, his manager lives out here and they've set up a kind of a, a, an MMA academy out here as well um i like his chances you know as long as he he stays the course i think he's gonna have a good career i mean he's had a good career it's just like that'll keep progressing his last one was was great yeah, um, was really good. i think some of my local fighters that are here um there's chase and blair he's a younger and up and comer he um he fights for cage warriors um I really like, you know, he's a division one wrestler. He has a good grappling base and now he's, you know, refining his skills and adding notches to his belts for, with an MMA. Um, I think Angela Hill is, is still learning and growing and, um, she's always been in the top 10 for her weight division. But, um, I think that she still has, she still has some, some more fight in her, uh, even though I think she's in her late thirties now, but still, I mean, she, she's, She's still young and spry at heart. Um, yeah, but mostly I think the grapplers is what I'm excited about a little bit more mm. with disciplines uh, like PJ Barch and uh, Keith Krikorian. Both of them were in the last ADCC. I see them mm. times a week. Um, so I like this fusion uh, class I have going at Legion Jiu-Jitsu um, where we do it three days a week. It's like a pro class where it's fear black belt in jujitsu, or I invite you, you can come. And it's usually like 15 to 20 people. And, um, you get all sorts, you know, you get MMA fighters, you get judoka in no gi. It's all no gi based takedowns and we do submission grappling, but it's, it's all starting from your feet mm. um, for a lot of the content from my Instagram comes from, but, uh, Keenan Cornelius is there. Um, there's a, a whole plethora of grapplers that are there at a high level and they're, most of them didn't have much of a standing takedown base when I started this class a year and a half ago. So it's been a, a good trajectory as far as like growing and, and adding new tools to their already like, you know, long list of, of skill sets. So mm. I think I'm most excited about that because, you know, I like refining people at the top too, but there's just something to be said about seeing someone's growth rather than, well, we, we added this one little notch to their game and it might've helped them in the long run. But this is like, you see like people that couldn't do one takedown are now leading with that, you know? So mm-hmm. I'm excited about that. And then, you know, I get all sorts of people coming to that class, which is always nice, you know, MMA world champs that just come through. They want to drop in. Lovato came in last uh, month. Bilal Muhammad came in a few months ago. It's just, it's always like a synergistic cosmopolitan group of you know mma fighters no gi grapplers judo cut wrestlers that all synergistically work really well together sounds amazing that it? sounds like an absolute shark tank <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it sounds awesome things i've seen in that class where i'll always remember yeah yeah i'll bet um just got to ask because paddy's obviously one of our own mates so we're, we have a, an invested interest in, in in how he does 
obviously he's a very good black belt, but he's in probably the toughest division in the UFC, right? And you've got the likes of Oliveira, Makachev. Oh, yeah. I mean, how do you think he does against those guys? I think he could offer some real problems for the highest level fighters. It's just, you know, you know, on any day, anyone can be beaten. I would mm-hmm. say the odds makers wouldn't give him much of a chance, but I know what he's capable of. He has like some awkwardness that he's able to use to his advantage. And he has really good refined skills too, where he has some moves that are tricky where it's like, you would never expect it. Like, Mm -hmm. like I think um, he has this one, like I'm sure you guys have seen it. He fought um, blanking on the guy's name right now. It was two fights ago where he was kind of in trouble. The guy came in for a leg attack and then he was able to have like an arm in, Dars that was like from the backside mm-hmm. and cranked the guy over and then was able to get on top. And these are things based on his like lankiness and, and just affinity to be a little different in these moments rather than do what's conventional. And I think he's good at leaning in on those things. He's good. He's well-timed with his judo attacks. Um, if he's healthy and he, he got his ankle fixed and his foot fixed, mm-hmm. I think he could be a real problem for anyone at that division. He has good range. You know, and I think he did take some some critiques on, you know, from the highest level guys, the Bisbings, the Dominic Cruises, about some elements of his game where he might keep his chin up a little high. Mm-hmm. And if he works on those little things, I think I think anything's possible. And I say that in the most positive way for him. So I think he can not only give people problems, but I think he could see the top five. So it's just staying the course. Maybe if he's a little more disciplined, it would give me a little bit more confidence in that. Yeah, I was about to say, what, what do you think about weight fluctuations between yeah. camps? <laughs> but, I mean, I get it too. Like, uh, I have a lot of empathy towards fighters and their plights and weight cutting and all the things that correlate with, like, self-destructive behaviors. Where I did the same thing. I, I understand that. I, I can't knock anyone that's doing something at that level because we're not doing that. I mean, mm-hmm. like, you're going to, you're going to berate someone who's going out there and putting their life on the line fighting. Like, no, we're not. We're going to use it as entertainment. And then we can sit there as armchair quarterbacks and say what they should have done. So <laughs> yeah. I can relate to them. There's their plight empathetically. So I have a lot of confidence in Patty. You know, I, I like the guy too. I really, his personality, just him in general, like he brings mm. like this, this energy where, you know, the, the room becomes a little bit more happy when he's there. And I, I love that. You know, I've had other athletes where everyone has to be quiet and, and things get really heavy and there's there's tension in the air. And it's like, okay, this is the way we got to be right now. But, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm not going to try and change anyone who's who's on that side of like the introverted, maybe darker side. It's like, okay, this is, this is where they want to be at. I'll, I'll help make this a, a, a comfortable space for them in this way. But on Patty's side, it's almost like JJ I was talking about where everything's just a party when we're, you know, do walking to the cage. It was like, Oh, let's go. Everything's <laughs> fun. Tensions wow. in the air, nerves, hands are cold. Everything's a little bit, you know, ugh. you know, so I do think Patty brings all these elements to the game, which I really enjoy. He, I mean, he does use judo as a good takedown base. He does flying submission attempts, which I love. He has all these cool things that, you know, make me want to root for him. Yeah, he's such a good entertainer, isn't he? Like, oh, you know, he's, right. he's very good, but he's he's very Conor McGregor-esque in the way people look at him, isn't he? Yes. Without, without the, like, you know, Conor's great, obviously, but I do think he brings this level of delusion to the game a little bit where sometimes it's like, like he has proven to everyone that he is, amazing obviously but you know we all saw what happened with khabib we all i mean he did do pretty well though it's just it's been a while so i think it's like what have you done for me lately a little bit mm. in- yeah it's like you said though is is, is you should so, sometimes you know when your time is up and then you maybe you should give up at that point yeah i think we'll see maybe if he does fight chandler I think we'll see after that. That'll be so fucking hard. Yeah, I was ready to say that'll be that'll be a really hard fight. I mean, Chandler's going to be able to dictate where that fight takes place because he, 
I mean, he could take down Connor, I think, whenever he wants. So it's just whether he decides to go that route. If he decides to just stand and bang, which he does, <laughs> I think he could get countered. So just from a tactical perspective, it's like, are you going to do what's going to get the highest ratings or are you going to do what's going to get the win? Yeah. Yeah, it'll be a good one to watch. Uh, Justin, I know you've got a shoot soon, mate, so we'll let you go in a second. Is there anyone you want to shout out, any sponsors or, or anything you want to finish up with? Um, just my website. You know, um, I have a lot of uh, instructionals and I have a platform I've built for judo, wrestling, and jujitsu. And like I talked about here, how those all interfuse together on the Venn diagram and what works in the middle. So you can start from the beginner courses to the expert courses and everywhere in between. Um, so it's jflowacademy.com. So hopefully you guys find your way there to my website. And if you ever have any questions, DM me on Instagram or email me. Um, I'm pretty easy to find. So, so yeah, that's it. Brilliant. Thank you very much, mate. Thank you, buddy. Thank you, Danny. Good Thank night. you, Paul. Take care, guys.